Hi, I'm Pat Gunn, and this is a, a vlog that I'm recording on July 5th, 2020. <clears throat> so since the last time that I did one of these, uh, COVID-19 has changed significantly, uh, or at least the uh, in the United States, the numbers and the situation has changed significantly. New York City is no longer particularly hard hit. At least for now, the numbers are low enough that the city has partly reopened. A lot of restaurants have opened sidewalk cafes <clears throat> and workplaces are beginning to very gingerly reopen in a modified form. And so that's, that's great. Probably for the first time since March, I'll be heading back to uh, my, my workplace for one day next week. And um, I'm looking forward to it. I, I know that we're trying to keep capacity low. And there's a lot of precautions and a lot of changes that we'll be seeing. Um, but I, I miss my workstation. I, I miss my coworkers. I guess I won't really be seeing most of them, but uh, it'll at least be a little bit of hard-won normality gotten back. But unfortunately, even though New York has pushed the numbers down enough to make it seem like this is a, a good choice. The numbers are now beginning to bend in the wrong direction again. And more problematic, uh, the rest of the country is really not looking good by the numbers. We're seeing um, massive outbreaks in a lot of uh, states. We're seeing bad hospitalization numbers in Texas, in Florida, in Ohio, in Nevada. It's it's not going well, and it's not helped at all by a number of these states never having had sensible precautions to begin with, having a cultural resistance to uh, putting your head down and making it through tough situations by doing the right thing. And that means that they're going to suffer pretty badly, because even if their governors can be bent by the facts into trying to do the right thing, they're not it's it's going to be very difficult to get much compliance from the citizens in texas for example which is my originally my home state the lieutenant governor has long been kind of a dumbass and he's been denying the science and uh just pushing for us to ignore it and uh expressing his willingness to have people die um which I mean, it's it's really, really stupid. And the governor, fortunately, is a little more sensible, but not much. And with the recent numbers, Texas has announced that masks will become mandatory. But what we're seeing in several counties is that they're just deciding, well, we're not going to enforce that. And I expect that a lot of the United States, uh, you're going to have that kind of resistance to doing the right thing spread all throughout different levels of government and throughout the, the 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 people and so until things get really bad you're not going to see anything and some people even if things start to get really bad they're just not going to care and, and even for the people who might be bendable by the time the facts begin to bend them like they they have a friend or close family member uh, die it's too late like the numbers are already going to be terrible and so we're just marching towards disaster in large parts of the United States. Poor federal leadership is part of it. The fact that this has become a political divide, uh, even if an incomplete one, is part of it. But a lot of this is just, uh, it's, it's not necessarily from the top. It's idiocy that runs all the way from the top to the bottom of American society. And it's tragic because if if we had done the right thing a long time ago, and uh, then we could potentially be carefully reopening the country without having numbers like this. Um, there's there's a there's a number that that generally we we look at for understanding how transmissibility works, and it's called RT. And what it is is for every person who gets infected. How many people are they going to infect? Um, how many people are they going to pass it on towards? 
And if you have a if you have a number that's less than one, then it's not great because you still have a certain amount of spread, but the spread is diminishing. It's and so the 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 burden begins to lift, and you still are going to have people get sick and die, but the numbers will keep on decreasing. So that's what you want. An RT of one, unfortunately, means that eventually everybody's going to get it if if it stays there, because everybody is going to keep on passing it on to somebody else, and eventually you will hit the whole population, and everybody who could be killed by this is going to potentially be killed by this. There, there's some fudge factor because things get a lot worse if there aren't enough hospital beds. But if you have an RT that's greater than one, then you have growth in terms of the number of people who are infected right now. And that number, if it keeps growing up, then you will have hospital bed shortages and things can get very, very bad. And unfortunately, right, uh, so there, the, there's a site that I've been looking at that tracks these uh, things on a, uh, on a per, uh, per state basis, and it's called rt.live. So if, in, if you enter that in your browser right now, you'll see how each state is doing in terms of the transmissibility, as far as we can tell. And again, there's a certain amount of missing information because a certain amount of spread is going to happen that never gets reported. But they they factor these things in statistically. And you see, um, unfortunately, well over half the uh, half of the states in, in the United States have an RT that's, uh, that's greater than one. And certain states are doing very, very badly. Nevada is doing quite badly. Um, Texas and Ohio, where I have some relatives, and so where I have a bit more of a personal stake, they're doing pretty badly. Uh, I have relatives who are doctors, and uh, one of whom is a doctor in Texas, and he's been keeping an eye on this, and it really doesn't look good. It, it's a bad situation caused by defects in our culture, and partly caused by bad leadership. It's, it's scary, and I... I'm also really bothered to see that apparently the federal response at this point from the Trump administration is just to toss uh, toss his hands up and say, like, yeah, it's, it's going to happen. We're not really going to be able to do anything about it. And they could have done something about it. They could have done a lot more about it, but they screwed up at almost every point where they, uh, where they had choices to make. And so it's, it's very disappointing. So that's COVID-19, and uh, like it, it's depressing to see how, how badly the country is handling it. It's also embarrassing, because you see uh, most other countries are not handling it this badly. Uh, like, we really were doing well worse than most. Um, also recently, I, uh, so moving on to other topics, recently I was on a, um, a, a uh, a video conference chat with some CMU alumni and a conspiracy theorist who also, I assume, must be a, uh, a CMU um, graduate popped on and we were talking about other things and he started to talk about um, about some weird conspiracies about China taking over the world and COVID-19 all being not a real Ill illness and stuff like that and I... It, it was interesting to watch people get visibly uncomfortable because what do you do when people turn up in chats like that? Because um, I've seen what happens when you try and shut people down when they say weird things. And in fact, I've been on the side of saying things that could be considered at least not fitting with the politics of particular groups. And I still am pretty angry about one of those where I, I just expressed some politics that differed uh, from that of a group and ended up getting booted out of the group. Um, at the same time, conspiracy theories, I think that they're different because we're not talking about values here and different notions of what's right, but more different notions of what's true. Um, what I did was I politely suggested that his theories were not supportable and, uh, and we kind of nudged our way out of talking about politics and 
things relating to current events, thanks to the to the moderator after that. And I still wonder, was that the was that the best way to handle it? Uh, and what do I really want out of those com conversations when that when that turns up? Like, ideally, I would love to lay seeds of thought that would bring the conspiracy theorist out of their weird world. Um, I've really never seen. I've never seen former conspiracy theorists. Um, <clears throat> and so I, I worry that when, when somebody gets into that, they may never come back out. <clears throat> but uh, but I would like to, to bring people out of that if I can. Um, the problem is that when people get into that, they lose the tools of reasoning that can bring them out of it. <clears throat> or they've already lost it so thoroughly that... Um, that everything that they see ends up being filtered into feeling like more evidence for their conspiracies. But if I can't bring them out of it, then I'd like to gently rebuke them in a way where they'll drop the topic and possibly go away, possibly not, but uh, I don't want them to explode. And I'm still not sure what the right thing is here, um, but in general I've found that doing this kind of that's not really supportable and just keep on digging into uh, like you, you can either go light which is what I did which is suggest it's not supportable and try and find a way to gently change the topic or you can go heavy which is what I sometimes do or I will dig deep into epistemology and uh, try and query how it is that we decide what seems like a reasonable model for reality and I'd, I'd like to believe that people can be let out of that by such questioning, because I think that that is the kind of questioning that, at least in theory, would inoculate people. If you can really start getting a, a, a handle on them, uh, if you can start to bring them out, then they'll develop the tools to bring themselves the rest of the way out, in theory. But I, I haven't seen it happen, so I don't know if that, if that can happen. Um... But, but at least going light seems to produce okay results because you're, you're not pushing on them enough that they feel compelled to argue to the end. They're not going to go into like this angry frenzy of, of things. The, the going heavy can do that. But, but sometimes I, I've, I've just found that I can exhaust people with going heavy. And I'd like to hope that maybe if they're exhausted, maybe that, that, can, that itself can bring them out. But to do that, you really have to be polite you have to stick with it. And again, I, I haven't really checked back in with the people where I've gone a heavy anti-conspiracy theory with them. So I don't know if it's ever worked. Maybe it has, and maybe I've actually gotten a few people out, um, and I just would never hear from them again. That would be lovely. And it, uh, I would be willing to put in that effort and to make sure I stay polite and just carefully keep on dissecting bits of their epistemology. But I don't know if, uh, yeah, I, I don't know if it works. Um, a few, a few thoughts because it, it seems like iconoclasm is currently what we're seeing a lot of in the United States. Um, and there's been a lot, lot of argument back and forth about old political figures and our evaluation of them. I think that we need to be willing to learn new things about historical figures, have them in classes, have them be widely acknowledged when they're uncomfortable. We don't want um, uncritical reverence of people, and we don't want to be afraid to talk about faults. We don't want to hide bits of history just because they don't fit some pretty narrative that we've built. And the same same goes with uh, with nations. Like we we should be willing to recognize that most nations, including ours has done a lot of dastardly things and that very few nations come into existence with a very pretty origin story. At least if you're really looking carefully at what the origin is. Um, at the same time, I, I don't think that removing statues is uh, productive. I, I don't think that, it, uh, that a statue requires us to respect it or to see it a certain way. But I think it's unsavory to accepts this purifying perspective where we want to go through and dig up uh, a lot of our language, a lot of our statues. Um, I, I think that 
that it doesn't actually serve a concrete purpose to do so and it damages pluralism uh to to allow this uh this replace the world mentality to allow them even small victories they'll go after more um and i know that this sounds like a slippery slope but i don't see a reason to give them any victories whatsoever because again it doesn't concretely improve the world to rip down a statue statues don't hurt people um, when you see a statue, you don't naturally think, well, if they must have built a statue to them, I clearly should respect them. You don't need that. Uh, and most people, I, I think, I hope, don't believe that. They see a statue and think, well, this person may have been a huge jerk, or they may have been a cool person, but it's a statue, and it doesn't have to have a lot of meaning to us. Uh, and, and, and so absent any of that concrete benefit to be had we should we should judge these these things by having a strong distaste for iconoclasm uh we we don't need to to clean the world uh of of these harmless uh things that have stood up to yeah there there are a lot of statues made to pretty terrible people but they don't hurt anyone now in terms of of things like uh uh, things like renaming old military bases, I'm fine with that. I, I, I don't think that it's a great use of time, and it does run the risk of getting that kind of uh, iconoclastic spirit moving. But at the same time, I, I don't see a name as being such a permanent thing. Now, again, if you if you do allow it to happen, then you'll find out that there actually are very few people who really are uncontroversially good and and maybe like for example I, I think there's a Malcolm X Boulevard in, in New York City and Malcolm X was actually a pretty terrible person uh, and if we're gonna rename things uh, it, it might make sense to to rename that Boulevard but do we really want to have that cultural struggle over something that's really not causing harm probably not but I, I don't have the same kind of visceral dislike for renaming things as I do for tearing down statues. And I, I still, whenever I think about people tearing down statues, I think of the Afghan statues of the Buddha being destroyed by the Taliban. And uh, yes, the, the values of Afghanistan are such that nobody would build monuments to the Buddha uh, there today. But I, I don't think that the, that the statues of the Buddha really are hurting anyone or were hurting anyone. Um, and, uh, and I, I, and I guess to touch on, on another kind of related topic, uh, there's a, there's, a, there's a recent ban of Confederate flags on military bases. And my thoughts on Confederate flags are, uh, they are informed by the notion that a lot of meaning is, is personal. That uh, I, I'm used to the idea of a Confederate flag as just being, a symbol of I'm from the South and I like being from the South and I've known people of, of many races who have had them who are uh, from the South and they didn't have any issue with it and I don't really have any issue with Confederate flags myself um, I do have an issue with veneration of the Confederacy though which I have highly negative views on I think that they they did a pointless war, cost a lot of people uh, their lives, all for, for no legitimately good purpose. And I don't, I don't really believe in, in that strong notion of states' rights uh, that, that is part of the reason that they broke away. And I certainly have no um, nostalgia for, the, um, for preserving slavery, which is another one of the big reasons why they broke away. Um, so I have really nothing but contempt for the Confederate States of America. Um, the flag, again, I, I don't have that strong of a feeling about it because, again, it means different things to different people. But in terms of its presence on military bases, and maybe even to a certain extent the, the presence on, um, uh, on state flags, 
I, th I think it's really weird and kind of inappropriate to have a, a rebel, uh, a, a bunch of violent rebels who who went against this country and waged internal war on us to, to have uh, to have their symbols be part of our official um, any official state or uh, or to have it be present on military bases. I, th I think I'm more comfortable with trying to get rid of it there. But again, there's still this notion that what what actual harm is it causing? And there's there's not actually that much cause for it. Uh, some people see it as odious. Other people just it'll have a very different meaning. But the fact that it was an official symbol of a uh, of an armed rebellion that that resulted in a lot of lives uh, lives lost for really stupid causes that makes me more comfortable with the push to at least remove it from state flags and from uh, military bases and and yeah um to touch on another topic the capitol hill autonomous zone was a um was part uh it was it was an area of seattle that was um let me see if i can pull up some figures of it uh, on it No, they don't really have what I was looking for. Um, it was an area of Seattle that some protesters uh, fenced off and kind of made their own for a certain period of time. Uh, and they excluded police, and it was run by an anarcho-socialist uh, anarcho corps. And I have, I have a few thoughts of it uh, on it. I participated in, in Occupy Philadelphia. I don't regret that. Um, it was full of a huge mix of people with a lot of variety in how they saw the world. And even though there, there was also a strong anarcho-socialist core that tried to be in charge, um, I, I met and talked with people of, of many different perspectives, including a lot of uh, religious Quakers who uh, provided food and some showering uh, services and stuff like that to people. Um, I... Occupy was interesting and in the the internal social services that it had and how it ran itself. Um, not everything was good. Uh, certainly not everything was bad. It it wasn't uh, wasn't violent. Um, at least uh, if, if there was violence with Occupy, it was incredibly rare and I didn't see any of it. Um, so my feelings on Occupy are generally positive with some nuances. I think the Capitol Hill Autonomous Zone in Seattle stepped over several more lines to the extent that I don't approve of them at all. I think their claim of territory was much more complete, was much more state-like, and that they felt empowered to exclude police and other uh, standard societal services from the zone. And uh, there were residents in the area. Uh, and I, I don't think that states should permit this kind of breakaway is um, whether it's uh, intended to be a predecessor of starting a new country or just a we would like to do this for a while to make a point. I think states should at their discretion permit things like Occupy um, but, uh, but I, I, I just I think that usurping state power is a dangerous line to cross and it undermines the, legit le the legitimacy of the state and it damages the trust that we have in citizens that the rules that we vote upon and that the institutions that we grew up with are going to be there for us. And so I, I think uh, Seattle should never have permitted anything like uh, Chaz and that the mayor of, of Seattle should have been overridden or removed if the legal system permits it uh, and that voters certainly should not trust, uh, they shouldn't trust her or, an, uh, or vote for any politician who would permit anything like that. As a side note, it was interesting to see that their own internal police, at least in one well-publicized incident, were not good at exercising restraint. And they, in fact, were also highly armed, just like, unfortunately, American police are in general. 
Um, there are some badly needed reforms to be done with police uh, in the United States. That's a big topic, and uh, uh, probably there are better people to talk about the specifics of such reforms. Uh, there are better people than I am for that kind of thing, but uh, I do believe that uh, that we need um, a significant number of changes to, uh, to how police work in the United States. I don't want to abolish them. I don't really want to cut their funding, at least initially, by large amounts. I, I would like to see a lot more social workers doing things on the street uh, to, uh, to defuse situations. But, um, but we, we need some reforms. And if, if the reforms are successful enough, then maybe we can begin to experiment with reducing police numbers, but not before then. On a personal note, um, I, so I got a Fitbit some time back and I've been, uh, I think I've, I've been trying to avoid being one of those people who goes into fad diets and fad sleeping patterns and stuff like that. Um, I'm not really the sort to do that to begin with, but I, I don't want to move in that direction. But the Fitbit so far, it's it's been really good for helping me keep track of exercise, keep track of my sleep, stuff like that. I, I, I like having the numbers available, um, and it's it's been good for that. And I, I really need to be working on my health, uh, because being in my 40s, I can't afford to neglect things for too much longer. Uh, I'll keep on getting worse uh, problems the longer I do that. On the topic of problems, I've been having issues with kidney stones, which are not a, uh, at all a fun thing. Um, it's extraordinarily painful. Fortunately, I have the training in, in a sense of having suffered from really terrible cervicogenic headaches for many years, so pain is not something that I'm stranger to, but the type of discomfort that you get with um, with kidney stones, it's different. And uh, I almost would prefer the cervicogenic uh, headaches because even though, even though it's harder to think while I have them, uh, I, I don't feel like something much worse is going to happen, which I do feel with, uh, with with that kind of pain in your gut. Um, like, you, uh, with a really, really bad headache, you don't really feel like you're going to die. Um, but with, with that kind of gut pain, you do. Um, I had to go to the ER this week to, uh, to deal with that, and they gave me some meds that are helping. Um, I'm, I'm hoping that, uh, I'm hoping that I can deal with this and maybe find ways to adjust my diet and hydration levels to avoid this in the future, but definitely not something you'd want to recommend. Uh, if you have any doubts on this, talk to some older members of, you, of your family, and chances are some of them have had a kidney stone, and they will probably not describe it as a, a memory that um, they want to revisit. Speaking of poor health, um, my cats now are both quite old. And I've been having the heartbreaking experience of uh, one of them, my male cat, Tortfeaser. Uh, he may be near the end of his life. Um, he's been having heart problems. Uh, uh, he's on blood thinners and some uh, some other medicine to deal with arrhythmia in his heart. But he's not having a lot of luck with walking around. And that's, it's, it's heartbreaking to see. Like, you, he, so both of my cats, they've been with me for roughly 18 years. I think actually my female cat, uh, the one that you can kind of see behind me, Beefalo, she's a little bit older than, than he is. Um, and she has her own problems, uh, but they're not nearly as severe. I, I don't know how, how much he has left in him because he, he still seems to be, mostly doing okay apart from not having uh, apart from having a lot of issues with walking but the but the walking not able to reliably walk is putting a big damper on his spirits and it's, it's rough for me as well i'm carrying him around a lot and i don't know how this is going to work the more i go uh as i start to return to the workplace more regularly um it's rough and it, it's tough when you when you have 
uh, critters that, y that you've been with for that long. Um, I've been thinking a lot about the ethics of state sock puppetry in, in the sense that there, there's been a lot of talk uh, about uh, Voice of America and a lot of talk about uh, Russian uh, uh, troll farms and a lot about Chinese opinion makers. And I, I don't worry as much about Voice of America because they don't really operate that much in the United States. Um, but it's interesting to still think about them in terms of trying to influence foreign uh, opinion. I guess there's this reason, line of reasoning that goes that if people are so easily manipulated by the apparent opinions of other, uh, others, is it actually unethical to control or influence their expression of political dissent? using mechanisms like this. And it's interesting to contrast humans operating as individual cells in a hostile fluid, meaning like if, if you're uh, the, lone, uh, the lone person of political philosophy A surrounded by what you think is a vast majority of people with political philosophy B, you're going to behave a, a certain way. You'll be more tentative with everything you believe. Um, because I think that this is just part of our social wiring as humans versus people who believe that they're in solidarity with most of the rest of their community. And so they, they're more expressive with what they think. They want to defend that, uh, that, uh, those norms. So they kind of form a, a, a mat or a mesh. It's interesting to, to see how much we respect perspectives based on how many people hold them. And... There are questions like, what are we trying to achieve in our political moralizing? Are states actually threatened most of the time by differences in uh, political norms? Maybe we are. Uh, but are, are there principles to be found in terms of how we influence people? Kind of tied to this. There was a recent case where Zoom, which is a video conferencing company, has bumped into foreign state censorship. Uh, there's a group called Humanitarian China. And they've had conflicts with China over what they're doing uh, there. Uh, and China has requested that all their accounts be, be pulled. And Zoom has confirmed that they pulled uh, the accounts there. Uh, so from a narrow uh, legal perspective, at least in the United States, opposition to state censorship kind of comes from two factors. Uh, this, uh, firstly, the state has powers that no other actor has. And so their misuse it tends to be much larger than others because they they can use force. Um, there's also questions of the aboutness of the state um, in that if you are a member of society and your state is moving against your interests, then you're probably going to be a lot more bothered than other uh, other actors in society, private actors doing the same. Um, and, I mean, this argument is usually supported when people argue, uh, argue it by talking about funding. Like, I don't want my dollars going to this thing that I find abhorrent. But it probably, that argument is actually probably mostly disposable because if the state had access to funding sources that didn't depend on taxation, people would probably care just as much. They would just lose an argument uh, or they would lose a potential argument they could lean against the conclusion that they don't like. There is a third factor, which people might argue, which is that states have overwhelming cultural and economic power uh, when they act as pri private actors. But that's not as clearly a reason, um, uh, at least it, it, it's not as strongly enun uh, enunciated a reason in our political framework, although maybe it should be. And in an increasingly international world, both the first and the third factors come into play from foreign states as states can reach across borders and touch on uh, companies that uh, have a presence uh, within, uh, within their boundaries or that do business in, uh, within their boundaries. Or sometimes they'll, they'll grab people from, uh, through extradition treaties and other things, even if they don't have a strong business presence. We've seen Russia do this, and so I think it's it's important to think about these factors uh, in terms of state power and official opinions. Um, 
Um, moving on to a few other topics. Uh, there are two Civ-like games that I've been playing a lot recently. There's a game called Old World. Uh, I'm probably done playing with it for now, but I enjoyed it. It was a fairly different type of Civ experience with a lot more engagement with the dynamics of passing along power and families, uh, who marries whom, um, things like that. Uh, the, the, the kind of personal side of running an empire. Unfortunately, it was quite buggy. Um, but there are a lot of things that I liked about it, a lot of interesting ideas. One of which was that wonders become exclusive when you start to build them, rather than when you start to finish them. Some of the most frustrating experiences I've had in the Civ series of games is that when you start to build a wonder, and then a whole bunch of other civilizations start to build it, then it's fairly often that like just a few turns before you finish, another Civ will wrap it up and you lose a lot of investment. I, I just I hate that. Um, but in Old World, uh, once you start to build it, um, it becomes exclusive. Uh, nobody else gets to gets to compete with you on that. But uh, instead, you have to gather a lot of resources to even begin to build it, and um, and so that it turns into a resource management game. And resources in general are a much bigger part of Old World than they are uh, of the Civ series of games. And so I think that's pretty cool. Um, the, uh, one bad thing, they, there are fixed city start locations, and if you don't manage to get some of those locations, then you can easily be starved out by more expansionistic empires. Um, I warmed on that slightly while playing it, but I still much prefer the flexibility of being able to pick my starting location strategically. Like, can I block certain passages? Or I, I just I like the fiddliness of where can I put things and how does it fit into my future plans. I'm looking forward to another game called Humankind from Amplitude, who made a um, a uh, a space type uh, game. I'm forgetting the name of. Uh, oh yeah, it's a game kind of in the tradition of Masters of Orion, and it's called Endless Space Two. And I've spent countless hours on it, probably far too many hours on it. Uh, but it um, it's a really great game, and I, I have high expectations that Humankind will also be great. It still shares that no picking your starting city locations flaw, but it, it explores a number of other interesting ideas, uh, like a pre-settlement period of wandering around as a tribe. It's not available yet. Um, I, I think it's in closed beta right now, but... Uh, but I, I think it should be good, and in general I think that it's good to see a lot more experimentation in this type of games. Uh, we want to see more explorations of wild ideas, because otherwise I worry that we would reach that kind of stagnation that you see in the modern spreadsheet market, where one spreadsheet is largely the same as another and not a lot changes, and it's very hard to make any big changes in spreadsheets. And without competition, I think that Sid Meier it would be would pretty much preside over that. And yeah, there's a lot of neat kind of variable content that's not gameplay that will keep be work, uh, being worked in, like better video for leaders, uh, better music, um, stuff like that. But I think the, the basic mechanics, I want to see those mixed up, and I think a lot of these uh, other Civ-like games, they provide a chance to do that. Um, I have a few thoughts on Biden's choices for vice president. And because he's old, because he's really quite old, I think we need to seriously consider both that he may need to step down partway through his turn, or he may get sick, and also that he may not run for a second term, and so who should get a leg up on uh, potentially being a candidate in the future. And so I'm using a list from the BBC of likely options. I just want to run down a few of them, not all of them, uh, to give a few thoughts. So Kamala uh, Harris, I have mildly positive feelings about her. She's from California, so, uh, so she starts in the hole. I'm pretty skeptical of people from California because they have the wrong kind of liberal there. But she doesn't seem particularly woke, and that's good. And she's done a lot of things in her career. And she seems moderately qualified, not so much at the federal level, but she's done a lot at the state level of one of our biggest states. So I think she could be a, a decent candidate. Uh, there's Gretchen Whitmer, and she's the current governor of Michigan. Uh, she's less qualified than Harris, not nearly as charismatic. I don't really see her appeal. 
I know that she may only be on the list because of geography and also because of her reasonable, reasonable handling of COVID-19, but I don't think that's enough. There's Tammy Duckworth, who, uh, she's a really interesting candidate. Uh, she has good credentials with a clear military service where she suffered a lot for the country. I wasn't really aware of her uh, before doing a bit of uh, prep for this, um, uh, for, uh, for this uh, video. But with a bit of research, I'm, I'm impressed. One thing, she has a bit of the same potential uh, constitutional snag that some weirder lawyers might fight over in terms of where she was born. Uh, because she was born overseas to, I think, an American uh, military uh, figure. But uh, And our Constitution is kind of a bit of a mess on that topic. And McCain suffered a little bit of that with his candidacy. But nonetheless, I think she she could be a really good candidate. Uh, I, I, I like her. There's Elizabeth Warren. I used to really like her, but she got woke and I lost a lot of interest in her. I still think she'd probably do a, a good job and she's probably qualified, but she doesn't really fit Biden's style or his politics very well. And so I'm feeling pretty cool on her now. Uh, there's Tammy Baldwin. Uh, she seems qualified, but she's from from the I, I think she's from the woke part of the left and I really don't like that and she's been part of that for a much longer time than Warren so I'm I'm very cold on her even though it's important to win Wisconsin there's Stacey Abrams who's just a no inexperienced and has really poor character uh, it's a very hard no uh, like I I'd still vote for that ticket but I would not be at all happy about it uh, there's uh, Keisha Bottoms and I think she's the mayor of Atlanta. I really like her. Uh, and I hope that she eventually goes far in her political career and I'm following her on Twitter. But right now I just, I don't think that she has the right kind of experience to do the job. So uh, I, I, I think that she'd be a weird choice. There's Susan Rice, who's my top pick. Uh, she's highly educated. She has a lot of relevant experience in, uh, particularly in diplomacy. Uh, she was unjustly used as a lightning rod for uh, a certain type of conservative during the Obama administration, but I'd rather blow through that rather than leave that smoke on the field. Uh, I, I just, uh, she has, in my view, the charisma and the education and the experience. And, and diplomacy, I think, is going to be something where uh, if, uh, assuming that Biden wins, there's a whole lot of stuff to fix up. Uh, in terms of, Mer of America's reputation. And I think Susan Rice would be in a good position to do that kind of thing. If, if she doesn't get the, um, if she doesn't get the running mate status, I, I think that she might be a really good secretary of state. And then there's Michelle Obama, who I like her, uh, but I just, I don't think it's healthy for nations to have family dynasties. And also she doesn't have a lot of qualifications. I, so I just, I don't think that uh, that relying on the family ties is a road that we should go down. Um, stepping, uh, moving on to uh, the Apple recently announced that they're moving away from the x86 architecture and that they're moving to an ARM based processor. It's interesting to see Apple doing this because it really doesn't feel very long ago, although I guess it was. Uh, that um, that Apple was moving away from PowerPC to x86 in the hopes that they'd be able to build system better systems cheaper because of the economies of scale of running on the x86 platform. Uh, I know that ARM has taken off significantly. Um, it's interesting that they b apparently believe that it's done so enough that that advantage uh, that the advantage of being on x86 is no longer really there. I'm not still not really sure what the if that was the only reason for doing this if they're just tired of paying intel uh like why are they doing this but uh it's 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 an interesting move and next step the operating system that osx is built on had this idea of fat binaries and it what this means is that it's fairly easy for osx to distribute uh directory bundles which is really what they're programs are with the binaries for um, for both Intel and ARM included in that bundle and have the OS just launch the correct one and then all the external resources like images and 
uh, and uh, sound and uh, and stuff are they're just part of the same bundle. It's a very nice way to design an app. Uh, they, they can just go back to to having fat binaries. Um, unfortunately, there's still a big mess for people distributing other types of software for OS X. Um, I I'm currently working in the sciences, and I'm not looking forward to dealing with this with scientific software, particularly Anaconda based software. Um, it's it's not going to be pretty, um, and I'm I mean we'll we'll need to figure out how to do it, but uh, it's it's going to be messy. Um, there was a recent Intelligence Squared debate on nations and nationalism, and in that, John Donvan asked a really great question. Can nations exist without nationalism? And a lot of this comes down to, I think, what is nationalism? And in the debate, they, they went all over in terms of trying to argue different definitions of what nationalism is. Um, there is a kind of nationalism that I believe in, that a nation is ex uh, essentially an extended family, a society where we have a strong obligation to each other's welfare. And so the kind of nationalism that I could believe in includes a belief in enforced borders and citizenship and in letting other nations within reason act as separate social experiments with different ways to, uh, to tackle their social problems. Now, this doesn't mean that I feel we have no obligation to outsiders. I still think that we need to prevent atrocities like genocide uh, and potentially to push against really terrible discrimination and, and also to push against using, um, using citizenship as a way to create a second class, at, at least as an intentional policy goal. And here I differentiate nations like Saudi Arabia and Qatar for um, for the way that they treat uh, Indians uh, and Pakistanis, where they'll bring them over and they'll need them to act as their workforce, as their primary workforce, where they do much of the labor of the country, and then the citizens of the country do very little labor. I don't think we want to be in that situation, and I don't think that we really should uh, be cool with other nations working that way. And our hands are a little dirty on this in the sense that we have a, a lot of seasonal farm work. And I would like to see that change in the United States, but that's a small portion, at least as I understand it, of the overall labor that happens in the United States. So we're not really there, but we should move further away from being there. But, um, but uh, and in general, I think we should also push pretty hard uh, against nations that are trying to be ethnic homelands for a lot of reasons. I think I've talked about this in other videos, so I won't go back into it. But in general, nations should experiment with different economic policies and political policies. And we should also have a certain amount of um, soft, soft pressure and hard pressure when we see things that are distressing or disturbing enough that it's worth pushing other nations on them. Um, I, I think that uh, when you see nations that have strong censorship regimes, we should probably push pretty hard against them. When we, you see nations that don't have traditions of free press, I think we should push pretty hard. I don't think that we should invade or anything like that, but, uh, but pushing, yes, I, I think that that's, that's a good idea. Um, on another topic, in general in the sciences, there's, there's an, occasionally an idea that comes up in our understanding of, of reason and how it works and in algorithms that approximate reason. There's this idea that when you have multiple independent methods that point you to the same conclusions, is it actually a signal uh, for uh, accuracy of those methods? Like, should we give credit to the idea that... Um, like if we're trying to estimate things about the age of the universe or um, characteristics of black holes, if we have methods that we believe are independent that push us towards the same answer, is that evidence? And we have a gut feel that it is, but I think that it would be really pretty hard to build a, a strong argument for it because we don't have a science of, of reasoning. I think it'd be very hard to make one. 
because in order to really approach this um, in order to really have like a material justification for this we would need to be able to quantify the, the states of the possible universes and the rules of the possible universes and at least to partly enumerate them and that is at least we, we don't currently know of a method to do that and if we can't do that strong kind of proof uh, we're just left with an intuition at least so far maybe there is an argument that uh, for this type of reasoning that we haven't thought of yet uh, or maybe people have thought of it yet and I just haven't uh, been exposed to it but um, but at least right now I'm not aware of ways to justify that kind of intuition and finally there's a a topic relating to Deep Space Nine, which is the the best series of Star Trek, and um, uh, and there's a series of episodes that focus on. Uh, I, I guess I would say that this is DS Nine and the Geniuses, and I may have talked about this before, so this might just be a refinement of previous uh, talking. Um, so the set of episodes that I thought were actually pretty beautiful were about genetically altered humans uh, who have been modified through procedures earlier in their lives to be uh, much more intelligent than most uh, than baseline humans. And I've had a certain amount of access to communities of people who are unusually intelligent, uh, kind of like that, and the people tend to be pretty weird. Not usually quite as weird as has been de uh, depicted in that show, but pretty weird. And there is a lot of creativity that you see in those communities that you don't see as much in normal people. And in in one particular episode, they are exp uh, they go off trying to predict the long course future of the galaxy. I mean, the, the the reason that they're given the ability to do this is that they first observe a speech and they're able to analyze subtle things in the speech that are not apparent to most people. And then they're given the opportunity to observe a um, some private negotiations, and they're able to observe some things in the state of mind of the people who are uh, of the opposing side that are not obvious to most people. And they do both of these successfully, and they then go on to produce some very long-term predictions of the outcome of of a war. And then, kind of as a joke later on in the episode, they then predict the long-term fate of the universe. Um, and uh, th and the episode kind of beats into them a little bit of humility uh, by demonstrating that their models were flawed because they didn't take much variability into account and one person acting in a su surprising way broke their predictions. And this may seem a little snide, but it, there's actually a deeper point here. And that is that um, untrained minds, even very bright ones, they have uh, like the, the very bright uh, minds that are untrained, they have a lot of energy and they can move very, very far, much, much further than most people do. Uh, and their, their energy brings them well outside of the day to day that a lot of people live in. And this is great, but they miss out on a lot of the accumulated wisdom of humanity over centuries. In more primitive times, a hypergenius would be far ahead of everybody, but in modern times, an untrained hypergenius would instead, a lot of the time, become a huge crank. Because a good education uh, places most minds, genius or not, on top of the edifice of civilization, and they get some access to all of the common knowledge and methods that we've conquered, uh, ways of thinking, uh, tools for thought. And this particular tool of thought that they miss out on is statistical reasoning. If someone is trying to predict things that are far enough in advance, the problem ceases to be closed form and becomes open form instead. And in order to tackle problems like that, you, you use a statistical analysis. And thus you're necessarily talking about levels of certainty if you want your analysis to become robust. And so a hypergenius with their intellect honed wouldn't guarantee future events. Instead, they'd lay out a number of possibilities with rough percentages and uncertainties 
to be clear, two separate numbers uh, assigned to them, and then they'd be able to potentially lay out some contingencies to deal with the most probable possibilities. But because these characters were uh, stuck institutionalized, they never got that kind of standard education, and admittedly it's harder to teach people who are like that, um, because a lot of teachers, they're not used to all the things that they're trying to teach being picked apart um, by people. But it's important to still teach those, uh, te uh, to teach people like that if you want them to be as useful as they can be. Sometimes that means finding uh, similarly intelligent people who have been through training and the standard uh, edifice of civilization. Um, but they missed out on that in the story, and so they're all kind of cranks uh, because raw intelligence is not enough. Uh, be just because uh, society has done so much, uh, at, at least over the last 200 years, in terms of learning how to think, learning how to do science, learning how to reason. And without those tools, and, and nobody's going to recreate all of them in their head. The chances of them doing that, even if they're incredibly bright, are really, really small. And and so it's plausible. It's actually pretty plausible that that they would make these kinds of mistakes. Uh, but yeah, so I, th I thought that that the episodes were interesting because. They touched on these issues. I don't know if they meant to, or if I'm possibly drawing my own analysis uh, on top of just they, they might have just brought it up as a topic, and maybe I'm running f uh, further with it than they meant. But in either case, I think it's it's an interesting uh, thing to think about. And uh, just a lot of really bright people struggle with this, particularly if they're going to try to be autodidacts. And in general, autodidacts, they end up becoming cranks for the, for the same reason, whether there is uh, whether they're actually uh, particularly intelligent or not. In any case, that's what I got for uh, for this um, for this video. If you have any comments on any of this, um, leave a comment or contact me. It probably shouldn't be hard to um, find contact information to poke me at. Um, if there are topics that, uh, that you think are worth covering, questions, things like that, if I hear about them, then I'll try and cover them in some future video. Bye-bye.